All right. Well, okay. Thanks to Avi and Tony for inviting me. I'm actually super glad to be here in person in two and a half years. I'll tell you a little bit of what I've been up to in the last couple of years. So yeah, this talk is going to be about the problem of refuting KSAT um, and how it relates to the resolution of an extremal combinatorial conjecture that Feige made. This is joint work with Venkat Guruswami and uh, you know our fantastic graduate student Peter Manohar at uh, CMU. So uh, you know uh, you might all be aware of the problem of procuring CSP. So I'll still like you know just define it and you know so that you know globally the notation I'm going to use throughout the talk. Okay. So I'm going to be interested in an algorithmic problem. The input to this problem is going to be a KSAT formula P. I'll always think of a formula in n variables and m clauses. The goal of the algorithm is to take and put this formula and output a number v between 0 and 1, okay, with a guarantee that v is a correct upper bound on the maximum possible fraction of constraints that any assignment can satisfy in p. Okay? Now, if v happens to be less than 1, then you know, uh, because of the correctness property of the algorithm, the algorithm has certified to you that the input formula is unsatisfiable. Okay, and so um, uh, we equivalently call this that the algorithm has succeeded in the task of weak refutation. Okay, I call it weak because I'll also care about strong refutation, which simply means that you know the number v is not just less than one, but is in fact bounded away from one by some fixed constant delta. Okay, so if you come from like an approximation uh, algorithms kind of uh, perspective, then this is same as saying that you know weak refutation corresponds to proving that every assignment must violate at least one constraint in the formula, while strong refutation corresponds to proving that every assignment must violate at least some delta fraction, a constant fraction of the constraints. Okay, good. So, you know, just like when you care about solving KSAT, you have to look at satisfiable instances. We are looking at the problem of refuting KSAT. So we're going to look at unsatisfiable, in fact, strictly unsatisfiable instances. So our goal is to basically design the refutation algorithm or at least study the existence of refutation algorithms that succeed for as broad a family of unsatisfiable instances as possible. Okay, good. So now a couple of caveats. I'm mostly gonna focus on certain average case models, okay? But I'll start my story with worst case so that you can appreciate what's going on in average case and how it differs, okay? Just provide us with the right context. And two, Almost everything I say actually applies to CSPs more broadly. So if you know constraint satisfaction problems, almost everything I say applies to them. There's an appropriate version of the statements I'm going to make that applies. But uh, you know, I'm going to stick to KSAT because it's a nice clean example that all of us are aware of. So you know, all the ideas will be visible for this special case. Okay, good. So let's start with the story of worst case. It's mostly going to be a summary of things that you already know. But it would allow me to place the average case complexity of this problem in the right context. Okay. Good. So to understand this plot, I'll make one comment, which is that if you take a refutation task and increase the number of constraints in the input formula, then intuitively you should expect the task to be getting easier. So in some sense, you know, you're adding more constraints, so you expect that the violation, you know, the fact that no assignment can satisfy all the constraints, should become somehow easier to spot because you know there are more constraints. It, at least it can't hurt. Right. So you might have a sense that increasing the number of constraints should somehow make the problem easier. Okay. And so to, to capture like this picture of worst case complexity, it's nice to somehow understand what happens in various regimes of density or the number of constraints of the input case at fault. Okay. So what you have here on the y-axis is the exponent of n in the number of constraints. So it's like you know, think of that log scale, but really I'm writing down the exponent of n in how many constraints you have. And on the y-axis, I'm going to write down the exponent of running time, also as a function of n. Okay. Now recall that I'm looking at k sat, so there are at most n to the k constraints. So the x-axis basically varies from zero to k, and you know the y-axis from zero to n because there's always an exponential time algorithm. Good. Okay. So I said that you know the problem in particular should become easier as you have more constraints, but really in the worst case land, you see the first non-trivial change from exponential time to you know slightly sub-exponential time. Once you have n to the k minus one constraints, okay. Now this the curve here is like basically the behavior of best known algorithms, and it's also tight if you assume some strongish complexity theory hypothesis called the exponential time hypothesis. It's not important for you to believe this. Uh, it's okay to just think of this as like the curve that we know for the best known algorithms, and you know that would be okay for my story. Okay, good. So 
in between n to the k minus one and n to the k, there is like a sub exponential algorithm that exists. And again, the behavior of this algorithm is tight if you assume the EDH. And then there's a polynomial time algorithm that starts existing once you have omega n to the k constraints. And you know, all of these are more or less classical results. The curve, the yellow curve is really linear because I'm drawing the exponent of the running time you know, against the exponent of n in the number of constraints. So it is really linear. It's a linear interpolation from exponential time to polynomial time as constraints vary from n to the k minus one to n to the k. Okay, good. So once you understand, you know, this way of uh, under, you know, representing what we know about worst case ksat, it's actually um, uh, nice to somehow talk about what happens to random ksat. Uh, one quick point, you know, maybe the only thing you need to remember from this slide is that, you know, the two transitions are happening at n to the k minus one and n to the k. Okay, that's maybe the information you should remember. Good. So here is a curve, a similar one, but this time for random ksat. And because I'm going to talk about a couple other random models in this talk, um, I'll often call this fully random case to somehow, you know, disambiguate. it, okay? What do I mean by random case at? Here is the model, okay? I'll generate each clause of this formula as follows. I'll choose a random, uniformly random k tuple of variables. And then, you know, randomly, uniformly randomly flip or negate each of the variables I've chosen to create a literal on it. I'll repeat this m times, okay? So in principle, this is the maximum possible randomness you can expect in an m clause formula. And that's what the fully random model is, okay? So given such a model, if you have, you know, about some constant times n constraints, you know, for three, for example, it happens to be about 4.5 or something less, then, you know, the formula is unsatisfiable with high probability. This is like, you know, not that hard to prove using some standard churn off this union bounds. Maybe getting the right constant is hard, but let's not worry about it. So our story really makes sense because we are interested in refutation. You know, once you are beyond this constant times n regime, and there's a similar picture you can draw compared to the previous slide, except the transitions are leftward shifted. Okay. So there's a sub exponential time algorithm that starts existing as soon as you have like n to the one plus epsilon constraint for any fixed epsilon. Okay. And then there's a polynomial time algorithm once you have at least n to the k over two constraints. Okay. So this, the two thresholds are quite a bit different from you know, the worst case thing. So at least it tells you that you know, something non trivial is happening in the average case uh, regime. Okay. And in fact, a lot of non-trivialities are happening in the sense that there is a lot more structure to this problem. You know, the behavior is quite a bit different from worst case case act. And there are sophisticated non-trivial spectral algorithms that actually cause this behavior to appear. So, you know, they arise because of some nice, you know, um, eigenvalue computations of appropriate matrices. Okay. And it turns out that, you know, somehow this particular threshold of n to the k over two uh, turns out to be like a natural stopping point for several different algorithmic approaches. So, you know, we actually call this the spectral threshold, you know, just to, uh, you know, uh, remember that this is the threshold that somehow polynomial time algorithms don't know how to beat so far. Good. So, uh, because this curve is going to be important to me, I will, uh, you know, uh, write it down, write down like, you know, uh, uh, the precise uh, uh, trade off here. Uh, it's exactly what, you know, the diagram says, but, you know, just to have this uh, uh, expression in your mind as I go on. So, I'll parameterize the number of constraints you have with this parameter L. Okay, and here's the way to interpret it. So this like looks like a complicated expression, but it's really not. If you plug in L equals N over there, you get basically N and ignore the log factors, okay? So when L is basically N, you have an exponential time algorithm and you know, it succeeds by what M is at least N, which seems to fit our bill. And when L is one, you have N to the K over two up to log factors, number of constraints. And there we have a polynomial time algorithm, okay? So basically that's the interpolation trade-off I was talking about, okay? Good. So that's great. Now, um, um, so far I've been talking about algorithms, but there is actually another uh, mysterious uh, phenomenon that seems to occur in the context of random case. Art. Okay. So <clears throat> there is a regime strictly below the spectral threshold. In fact, polynomially below. So like, you know, short by like some n to the epsilon factor such that in this particular regime, there exist polynomial size refutations, as in there are witnesses of polynomial size that you can efficiently confirm, like you can use them to check that the input formula is unsatisfiable, even though we actually don't know any polynomial time algorithm to find. Okay. Now, this is somewhat surprising to us because there is no worst case counterpart of this behavior. There is no, you know, uh, uh, no known phenomenon where somehow there is a regime where there is a polynomial size, you know, refutation or certificate of unsatisfiability, but somehow polynomial time algorithms can't access. Okay. 
Now again, here we don't have any proofs that polynomial time algorithm cannot access it, but so far as we know, that's a proof. Okay, that's the behavior for the best known algorithms. And so this is a very clever result of Feige came and Ofek, really one of a kind in the sense that I don't know any other result of this sort. Uh, it was proven, you know, using a combination of combinatorial and spectral techniques. Um, uh, and, you know, for, for example, for K equals three, which is the case really they studied in the paper, uh, the regime happens to be between n to the 1.4 and n to the 1.5. Okay, good. So um, this is great. We have like a lot more interesting, sophisticated picture for random KSAT. Um, we had like a slightly disappointing picture for worst case KSAT. So, you know, you might wonder, you know, what's going on here? Like, you know, in some sense, what's going on to the complexity of KSAT or refuting KSAT in between these two, you know, models, right? And um, uh, if you are thinking from the perspective of what it is telling us about the problem, you might have a suspicion that, you know, maybe we are overusing the randomness in the model. After all, you know, our results are, you know, are true for like a very specific random model. So have we somehow overused the assumptions? Like, you know, how robust are they? How much randomness do we actually need for these results to actually work? And we have like, you know, pretty clever ideas and algorithms and certificates going on. It would be a shame if, you know, somehow it's very married to, you know, the specific model we are using. So a natural question to ask is like somehow what happens to all these kind of results if I move away from the specific model of randomness, uh, you know, that we use in proving them. Okay, that's somehow the motivating part. And uh, this was, you know, somehow the motivation for Feige in 2007, about 15 years ago, when he defined a significantly more general model of random CSPs uh, in the effort to like study this, you know, uh, interpolation business. Like, you know, where, where does, you know, more general models of random case at set. So here's the model he considered, and this is like inspired from the Spielman thing, smooth analysis for linear programming. Um, the idea is you start from like a worst case instance, so it's an arbitrary formula now, but then you randomly perturb each literal pattern. So like, you know, you take, I don't know, the first variable in the first clause and like, you know, flip the negation pattern on it with like some fixed constant probability, let's say 0 0.01, okay? That's the model, okay? Now, uh, the key thing to remember is that, you know, I, have, I haven't changed the clause structure at all. So the clause structure in the uh, formula is like completely worst case. It's only the literal patterns where there is randomness, but, you know, it's not very hard to show. In fact, it's just the same churn of first union bound kind of argument that, you know, this randomness is enough to make the formula unsatisfiable with high probability, as long as you have like some constant times and, you know, uh, constraints to begin with, okay? So the same thing holds, therefore our question makes sense. You know, I can still ask to refute these slightly more general class of random ASAT formulas. Does the model make sense? Okay, very good. So that's the question, you know, we, we're gonna study. And basically what I wanna tell you is like basically the story of smooth case okay? That's, that's basically the story, okay? Uh, so- Robert, Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, is point of one fixed for any variable or can an adversary play between point of one and point of two? Great question, or yeah. As long as you're flipping every literal with some constant probability, it could be different for every literal, that's fine. But as long as you're flipping it with like some fixed constant probability, it's gonna be okay. Okay. I think this is a good time to pause and see if you have any questions about the model, etc. Okay, very good. So yeah, so let me tell you, you know, what, what result I'm gonna to present today. So uh, this is the result actually, you know, like. That the result is that you know the exact same algorithmic trade-off that I showed you for random case that actually holds for smooth case. Hat. So you know nothing changes. You know there is a sub-exponential regime between n and n to the k over two. There is a polynomial time regime from n to n to the k over two. Okay, that, that's the main result. Uh, but somehow you know the proof of this is uh, uh, quite a bit different because uh, uh, you have much less randomness to work with. So you know in some sense you have to come up with. Uh, a different way of arguing, uh, you know, uh, new spectral algorithms and things like that. Okay, so that's basically the punchline, right? Like somehow we're going to be able to uh, get different algorithms and different analyses for random KSAT that somehow use significantly less amount of randomness to go through, and therefore, you know, extend to smooth models. Okay. Um, yes. Can you say a little more about what, what do you mean? We start with the worst case instance. This... So just like take an arbitrary formula. Oh, completely arbitrary formula, start from any case at formula, but then like perturb the literals, right? So like the starting formula may be satisfiable, so it may not even make sense to ask the refutation question for it, but we're saying that if you perturb the literal patterns, you're gonna create an unsatisfiable formula, so that's what we'll work with. Good, okay, very good. 
So, uh, so here's a quick reminder of you know what we knew about this smooth model. It's like a slightly more general model than random model. So you know um, the same trade-off I showed you you know was proven for random KSAT you know about uh, whatever seven or so years ago. Um, but for smooth model, somehow much less is known. So you know in the paper that Feige introduced this model, he was able to get a weak reputation for smooth instances of three SAT. Okay. Uh, the weak part was somehow inherent in the sense that, you know, uh, Feige combined some combinatorial tricks along with the spectral reputation, uh, you know, uh, uh, in contrast to like a purely spectral strong reputation that is known for random case. And somehow, you know, the idea was inherently tied down to three CSPs, so it does not go to four CSPs even for weak reputation. And even for three CSPs, it does not some, seem to, you know, extend to strong reputation. So roughly speaking, you know, we were a little bit like, you know, maybe in a land where we didn't understand the smooth regime very well. Okay. Um, and the direct starting point for our work, like the stuff I'm going to show you today, is this paper that we wrote with our student Jackson Abascal, like a couple of years ago, um, where you know we were able to handle like a slightly more general random model called the semi-random model. Now I will not directly care too much about this model, but let me just like you know spell it out to you. It's very easy. If you make that 0.01 the flipping probability that I you know talked about in the smooth case to be like half, as in like you make every literal like you know purely random. The clock factor is still arbitrary. You get a semi-random instance. Okay, so it's a, it's a special case of smooth instance where the where the flipping probability, you know, is basically exactly equal to half for every literal. Okay, so you know, uh, in that work, basically we were able to get the one end of the trade-off, like this polynomial time regime for you know uh, strong refu strongly refuting you know all case CSPs and in particular case at. And what this work does is like you know um, takes it and you know uh, gets like a smooth. Uh, refutation for KSAT, uh, you know, including all of this curve. Uh, and that, that's basically the first uh, main thing. Okay. Now you might be thinking, okay, you know, we kind of knew the polynomial time regime already. Why do we worry about some exponential time algorithms? I mean, I think, you know, maybe I won't, uh, maybe like this is an audience I don't have to worry too much, you know. Uh, <laughs> but like, you know, I don't know, if you were an algorithms person, you would probably be very unhappy. Like, you know, we are spending so much time on two to the end to the one half algorithm. Should we do it? What I'll show you is that, you know, uh, this I didn't know, and this is like some of the most exciting parts. Somehow, you know, this is going to relate to the existence of polynomial size reputation. So, like, one of the punchlines of this work is that somehow studying this was worthwhile after all, because you know, uh, knowing the trade-off here uh, would somehow help us, uh, you know, understand this Feige Kim effect style refutations below the spectral threshold. And you know, so that's that. You know, that's coming up. You don't have to understand it right now, but you know, it's just like trying to help you. You know, at least not feel too bad about you know the sub-exponential regime. Good. Well, so is there also this type of behavior in this case of like having refutation? Good. And That's the next slide. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, I kind of, you know, uh, bungled my punchline, but you, you know, you were expecting it. So that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah. So basically, you know, uh, the second punchline is going to be that uh, the exact same polynomial size uh, refutations below the spectral threshold, that phenomenon actually happens even for smooth instances. Okay, and uh, in fact, the threshold is exactly the same for k equals three. Our proof right now does not give the same threshold as random for like uh, you know four, four sat and beyond. But and you know if you ask me a little bit often, I tell you what's going on. But you know uh, the bounds are a little bit uh, weak in the exact sense, which you know some it still gives a constant for every CSP, constant uh, gain in the exponent below the spectral threshold. But the constant is not the same as the random case if you go for k equals four and beyond. But regardless, like as a qualitative phenomenon, you know, we can establish that, you know, for all uh, CSPs now. Okay. And uh, this is very nice because I get to take a complete detour and like forget CSPs for a while to, you know, talk about this a little bit. So the key uh, ingredient in making this happen is, uh, you know, the proof of a completely standalone combinatorial conjecture, which, you know, uh, Hopefully, you know, you will, you will like even without any CSP connection. Okay. And I'm going to, what I'm going to tell you is like, you know, uh, what this, what this conjecture is. Okay. Good. So you can forget about CSPs for the next five minutes. Okay. Because this is like completely standalone. So let's look at the following question. Suppose I give you a graph on N vertices. Okay. And I tell you that the average degree of the graph is D. So in other words, there's like N times D over two edges. Okay. And I ask you, how large, if I give you a graph and you are, you're free to choose a graph, you know, up to these constraints, how large can you make the length of the smallest cycle? Length? So how large can you make its girth? Okay. So if, for example, D is two, I can create one giant cycle. The average degree would be two. 
and the vert would be n, right? So clearly for d equals two, I can make it as large as n. It turns out that if I make d even slightly bigger than two, the average degree, then there is a log length cycle in the graph, okay? More precisely, there's always a cycle of length two times log of n to the base d minus one plus two, okay? And this is like a pretty beautiful result of uh, Noga, uh, Huri, and Lineal, uh, which you know goes by the name of irregular Moore bound, okay? So you might have heard about the Moore bound, which basically is a similar statement, but for regular graphs. And you know, the AHL result shows that in fact, you know, you don't need regularity to get. In fact, you know, this is, this is pretty interesting phenomenon by itself. It turns out that we don't exactly know uh, if two is the right constant, and there is uh, quite a bit of work on figuring out whether two is the right constant. We know that four it has to be, you know, uh, at least four thirds, but we don't quite know, uh, you know, where the actual constant lies in between. Uh, but not our concern today. Okay, that's what we'll focus on. Good. So that's uh, all done. That's not what I'm here for today. Uh, I'm going to ask the same question on hypergraphs. Okay. I'm going to ask the same kind of questions. Like, you know, I give you n vertices. Um, and you know, some number of edges in a hypergraph, there's a three uniform hypergraph, and I ask you, what's the smallest cycle? How large can I make the length of the smallest cycle in it? Okay? So maybe the question you should ask is like, what does it mean to be a hypergraph cycle? So let me explain that, okay? For that, I'll try to abstract out a property of graphs so that you know, uh, it's the right property that somehow generalizes, okay? A cycle in a graph is a subgraph, collection of you know, edges, so that every vertex appears an even number of times in it, right? I'm gonna take this property and generalize it, okay? I'm gonna call a cycle in a hypergraph as simply a collection of hyper edges so that every vertex appears an even number of times, okay? Does the definition make sense? Now this might look like, you know, uh, weird. It's like, why am I doing this? But it's actually, uh, you know, uh, definitely relevant for us and you might even enjoy it a little bit more once I tell you this connection. Think of a graph, the edges of a graph, as describing two sparse linear equations. So like, you know, if the edge ij is present, think of the equation xi plus xj equals one or zero. And think of these equations as, you know, uh, modular two, so it's on the binary field. Then a cycle is simply a collection of linearly dependent subset of equations, right? Because if you add them up, you, you know, because they're all appearing an even number of times, you'll get basically zero. Right? In fact, you know, the girth exactly corresponds to the length of the smallest linear dependency. It's like how sparse a linear dependency can exist. So if you're a coding theorist, at this point, you should really enjoy things because, you know, uh, it directly refers to, you know, the, the distance of, uh, you know, the dual code. Okay, good. So now you see, like, you know, uh, we are basically generalizing uh, the property for two sparse linear equations to three sparse linear equations. That's exactly what we're doing. And so, you know, uh, maybe that's one good motivation for studying, you know, these kind of cycles. In fact, you know, they are also called even covers. Uh, you know, Feige basically studied this a whole lot and, you know, he used to call them, he probably still calls them even covers. Uh, good, any, any questions about this so far? Okay, very good. So that's great. So now, you know, let me tell you, you know, what the right Moore bound for hypergraph should be like. And this was a conjecture due to Feige. Um, in 2008, he conjectured that if, and I'm going to like write my number of edges in this funny way so that you're reminded of the kind of trade-off we had, uh, you know, a few slides ago. So, you know, for some number L, if I have N times N over L to the K over two minus one edges, hyper edges, then there must be a cycle of length L times log N. Okay. Let me like, you know, fill the stuff for a bit so that you can appreciate this trade-off. If L equals like um, uh, one, then this is saying that if I have n to the k over two edges, there should be a log length cycle, okay? So it seems like n to the k over two is supposed to behave like n for graphs, or like, I don't know, 10n for graphs, okay? Which is, you know, reasonable. If you were to view k is two, then k over two should be n, okay? <laughs> seems reasonable. But the very interesting part is that, you know, in the, in the graph setting, there's like a phase transition from like girth n to girth log n. In the hypergraph setting, there seems to be like a hole in between region. Like, you know, somehow if L is one, then this conjecture predicts that there should be only a cycle. I can, in some sense, if this conjecture is tight, then I should really expect like a n length cycle if I only have n hyper edges. Okay, by the way, this is, this is not so hard to believe, right? Like I should, if you take like N plus one random linear equations, 
you really expect like the smallest linear dependency should be omega n. Right? So you know this seems reasonable, right? That's the trade off that phi conjecture anyway. And um, uh, oh yeah, and that's the that's the uh, analog. That's the precise uh, thing that comes out for k equals three. And that's just like you know just writing down the same trade off again. Okay. Good. So yeah, it has interpretation for you know uh, rate distance trade off for LTPC codes, etc. So they are like coding theoretic reasons to care about this. Um, but the main reason uh, you know that justified phi this conjecture at the time was like you know phi was able to prove it for random hypergraphs. In fact, it's not very hard to prove it for random hypergraphs. You know, if the object is random, you know, you can try to just somehow, you know, try to usual first moment and second moment argument, and you can actually prove this, okay? Uh, the reason uh, Feige cared about this was because uh, you can do something very simple. You know, start from a hypergraph, okay? Um, find a cycle of length L log n. It's got a habit. Remove it. Remove all the hyper edges. So now you're a residual hypergraph. And if it's still, like, you only remove L log n edges, so, you know, uh, if the hypergraph is still large, you can like keep repeating this procedure, right? So in principle, if you start with like, I don't know, some big constant times this threshold here, you should be able to partition all, but like, I don't know, 1% of the, or like 10% of the edges into just like cycles, right? So you're getting like a cycle partition almost, right? And this was very cool because Feige observed, and this is basically the key idea in Feige theorem of X result, that this actually gives you a non-trivial refutation of KXR, okay? This is not our main story, but just so that you know you appreciate where this is coming from, I'll just say like a couple more lines about it. So, um, uh, if you take like a random KXOR instance, so you know KXOR just means that you have like K sparse linear equations modulo two, and random means that you know the right hand sides are plus minus one, uniformly random, independently for each equation. Okay. So now you know look at like uh, the equations that form a cycle, right? The equations are linearly dependent. So if you add them up, you get zero. But if the right-hand sides are like uniformly random, with only half you expect you know, things to be one or like you know, non-zero. That's a contradiction. What does that mean? It means that you know, any assignment must violate at least one equation in a cycle. So you know, the, the, the point that you know, Feige came effect had was that if I look at cycles for which the corresponding right-hand sides XOR out to minus one or like add up to one modulo two, then such violated cycles must have one violated edge, at least one violated edge, right? And so now, you know, this partition of uh, uh, edge destroying partition really helps because I can get a lower bound on the number of hyper edges that must be violated, right? So, you know, that's, that's basically the idea, okay? Now, it turns out that, you know, you want to trade off this L correctly with like, you know, some spectral reputation for like 2XOR and 1XOR, et cetera. And, you know, some correctly balancing these numbers gives you the end to the 1.4 threshold. Okay, that's the idea of FKO. Not our main story today, but that's basically how it works. Okay, good. So now, you know, he really needed this for random case. They were trying to prove this for random case at, but now you don't need to just show that, you know, there is one cycle. You need to show that there are many edge disjoint cycles. If the conjecture is true, it's like easy. You just peel it out. But if you have to argue it for like random hypergraphs, it's rather difficult because now it's a very complicated structure. And so you know it was kind of a sophisticated argument to prove this for you know uh, a random uh, uh, random k uniform hypergraphs. But they managed to actually show not exactly the peeling off kind of argument uh, or like disjoint cycle partition. They got like something which is like almost disjoint cycle partition that somehow is still good enough for the same trade-off. Okay. Now these kind of you know negotiations you've got to do because you know it's a somewhat tedious calculation. Uh, so they conjectured that you know this edge disjoint cycle partition should probably exist, but you know they established something weaker that's enough for the purposes. Okay. So now you know um, over time though you know Feige conjectured this and you know he realized that you know this kind of result should probably hold for like regardless of the clause structure, like regardless of what the clause structure of the case are formula looks like, that the result should be true. Like uh, and that's the motivation. That's one motivation for his conjecture. And over time, you know, there have been some works that, like, you know, try to make uh, some progress in this direction. So there was a paper of uh, Asaf and uh, Verstrait um, that basically shows like one end of the trade-off. So you know, the L equals order one regime. So like, you know, the regime where there is a log L n cycle, that's kind of understood. Okay, that's that's basically this result over here. And then you know, following that, there were some suboptimal but you know non-trivial trade-offs by Noga and uh, Udi Feige. And then you know, a few years ago, there was like a nice approach, uh, you know, combinatorial approach to attack this conjecture. Um, and I think they even had bound for like some relaxations of this even cover problem, but not for the cycle problem itself. That's you know that's basically the abridged history of this uh, conjecture. And uh, you know I I'll, I'll, I'll try to do this proof 
more or less completely today, or at least I give you, you know, almost all the ideas in it, okay? But basically we can prove this conjecture. You know, this conjecture is true and, you know, I'll, I'll show you more or less a proof of it. Now, um, uh, there is a stack of log to the 2K uh, uh, n factor. So there is like an extra log n we need in the number of edges. Um, and, you know, I can show you why it potentially is removable at the very end, but right now we don't know how to. Okay, does it make sense? Okay, very good. So uh, uh, these words are not supposed to make sense. They are supposed to be like, you know, things that will remind you of uh, like that, you know, they are, they are supposed to like uh, evoke memory associations once I tell you how we prove this, okay? So uh, the idea, at least we call it the spectral double counting idea. And it seems like an interesting a new uh, idea to somehow, you know, prove such combinatorial statements. Um, and somehow, you know, uh, there is like a reduction so like maybe there are two key important points and you know this is something that you can potentially take away one is like somehow there is a way to reduce hypergraph problems to graph problems uh, in a non lossy way and i'll tell you exactly what this you know construction is so you know this translation from hypergraph to its graph i'll call the kikuchi graph and i'll explain to you what the kikuchi graph is and second there is a connection between the success of spectral reputations in sub exponential time and the existence of you know hypergraph cycles okay Somehow there is like a tight connection, uh, you know, uh, between these two ideas. And in fact, that's how we actually prove this. Okay, so I'll, I'll also try to justify this statement. So that's basically it. And you know, I'm going to do some math. Um, uh, so it's good time to pause and see if you have any questions. Yes. So it seems you can get down your uh, point zero one um, probability to flip a. Uh, literal to maybe even sub-constant? Uh, yeah, but then like you will lose it in the thresholds. Yeah, I mean, there is really a trade-off for like every probability, but then, you know, the thresholds will change. Right now, you know, this 0 0.01 really multiplies, uh, you know, uh, in fact, like 0 0.01 to the K multiplies like all the bounds and number of constraints we need. Uh, if you make it sub-constant, you know, then yeah, you will have to account for those factors. But yes, there is a, you will, you will get basically a whole regime of interesting behavior. Uh, even for like sub-constant uh, uh, negation probability. Okay, very good. So uh, let me tell you the details. Uh, uh, you know, this is like some big roadmap, which most of it I will not tell you, but this is like a map, you know, if, if, you, if you're like interested in any of the components, you can ask me later and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So we want to do smooth case art. That's our goal in life, okay? Um, there's like a very simple reduction to semi-random KX, okay? So there's basically an appropriate SDP that somehow, you know, reduces to just, uh, you know, looking at semi-random versions. Remember, semi-random version was the version where, you know, you flip every literal with probably half instead of like 0 0.01. So that's kind of nice. We don't have to worry about the 0 0.01 at all. And this is where Yuval's question gets answered. Like, you know, in this step, we lose something. Uh, you know, that depends on the flipping probability and the arity of each class, but that's it. After that, you know, the 0 0.01 doesn't play any role. Okay. And now, I don't know if you've, edit, if you've ever played with like, you know, uh, these KXR kind of problems, the fate of even and odd is like somehow very different. It turns out that, you know, even, you know, plays very nicely, you know, it's like nice to us and you no know, things are clean. You try to do it for odd and like somehow almost everything breaks and you try to keep like, you know, somehow working a little bit harder. That's how life is even here. Okay. So uh, that's why, you know, I'll, I'll focus only on the even IT case in the talk, you know, so that I give you somewhat clean ideas. Um, I, there are clean ideas even in odd IT XR too, but, you know, just somewhat more technically complicated, okay? So um, uh, 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 all these words are not supposed to make sense, so let me even ignore them. What I'll mostly do is like, you know, I'll try to tell you, because this is the main takeaway, I'll try to tell you how the structure of the Kikuchi graphs of hypergraphs you know, really resolve this conjecture. Like in some sense, it's uh, the first time we saw this, like, you know, just, uh, uh, so it's, 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 we couldn't believe it works in some sense, like, you know, <laughs> because it's, it's somehow so simple. So I'll, I'll try to focus most of it, you know, most of the talk on, you know, this part, okay? But I'll give you a rough idea of how all components look like and where they fit, but technically I'll just focus on that part, okay? And I wanna find, you know, point out that the key idea, uh, this, you know, the, the idea of using certain Kikuchi matrices really comes from an older paper. It was a paper due to, uh, you know, Alex Wine, Ahmad Alawi, and Chris Moore. Um, and I'll tell you what context they were trying to do this in. So they were trying to work for this so-called tensor PCA problem. I'll, I'll, you know, clarify what that means you know, a little bit more. But really, in some sense, uh, you know, if I had to have an alternative title for this paper, it's like, you know, 
it's like it's it's it's, it's an ode to the you know uh, Kikuchi matrices. Like you know somehow they are they are they are awesome. Like you know you write them and somehow suddenly things just work out. Okay, so good. So let me tell you you know how it all works. What I'm going to do is start with the case of random four x. Okay, four because it's like the smallest non-trivial even number. Two is very easy, so I'll focus on four. Okay, and I'll start by telling you a very classical idea. Okay, I'll tell you how spectral refutations work. If you've seen this before, you'll be a little bit bored for like maybe five minutes, but I'll move on very quickly. Okay, so let's start with the case of L equals O of one, meaning like I want to refute at n to the k over two or more constraints. Uh, for you know, for four, it's like n square or more constraints. Okay, so if I look at four XOR constraints, first of all, I'm going to work on plus minus one valued variables instead of zero one. Okay, if I look at it that way, then four XOR constraints simply correspond to monomial constraints. I want the product of you know four bits to be plus one or minus one depending on what the right hand side is. Okay, reasonable. Okay, very good. So what? So given a four XOR constraint, set of four XOR constraints of this type. I can write down uh, a four uniform hypergraph that corresponds to the instance. This is just basically the set of four tuples that appear are the hypergraph. And then there's like a, you know, a bit, a plus minus one thingy on each hyper edge. Okay, good. So given the instance represented as a hypergraph and like some, you know, weights on each hyper edge, I can write down a degree four homogeneous polynomial related to the instance. Okay, it's a very, very easy polynomial. It simply, you know, multiplies each monomial by its right hand side. Okay. And you know, I'm just averaging or normalizing because I want to deal with numbers which are in like zero, one. In fact, minus one, one in this case. Okay. So that's my polynomial. And you know, uh, what does this polynomial do? Well, if there is an assignment X that satisfies all the constraints, it will evaluate to one. Okay. And if an assignment you know, fails all the constraints, it evaluates to minus one. So you know, it's between minus one and one. Um, and you know, in some sense, you can think of it as computing the advantage over half of an assignment. Half is the right number because a random assignment gets you half, for example. OK? Good. So that's this polynomial phi x. And our refutation task, because you know, this polynomial computes the advantage over half, is simply equivalent to uh, you know, getting a certificate that phi x is at most epsilon for some tiny epsilon. And I'm looking at strong refutation. That's why I want you know, arbitrarily tiny epsilons. Reasonable? OK, very good. So let's see how we do this. Here's the key idea. And this idea actually goes back to uh, a work of Gert and Krivilovich that really introduced spectral refutations to you know, uh, CSP refutation land. Uh, their idea, by the way, also was for even uh, XOR because somehow odd takes a lot more work. And it took like two or three more years to get to the odd thing. But here is what this suggests. It's very, very simple. Okay? We'll draw a matrix. We'll write a matrix corresponding to the phi x polynomial. And what's the matrix? It's going to be indexed by all possible pairs of variables on the uh, rows and columns. So there are n choose two rows, n choose two columns. OK? Very good. And now, at an entry i, j, k, l, what do I write? Well, if i, j, k, l is a portable that appears in a constraint, I'll write down the right-hand side of it. Otherwise, I write down 0. OK? Good. Once I have this polynomial, the key observation, which is very simple, is that the degree four polynomial I wrote down on the previous slide is a quadratic form of this matrix. Okay, on what vector? Well, this x to the circle two is basically the vector of degree two monomials in x. Okay, so it's it's n choose two dimensional. Uh, there is like an entry corresponding to every set of size two of variables, and at i comma j, I have x i times x j. Okay, now basically, if you know how quadratic forms work. You expand it out, you're basically going to get like sum of aijkl times xi, xj, xk, xl. Uh, each ijkl appears like six times if I got my commutator x right, so I just scale it down. Okay, but that's it, right? My phi x basically looks like a quadratic form up to some scaling. And the cool thing is, because it's a quadratic form, I can use like a spectral upper bound on it. Okay, so I'm simply going to upper bound it by the L2 square norm of this vector x. X is a plus minus, so X circle two is a plus minus one minus vector. So this two norm squared is simply N choose two. So I basically have a bound which does not depend on X at all. It's like one six times N choose two times the spectral norm of it. So now, you know, all of our life reduces to the understanding when is this spectral norm small enough to give me a non-trivial refutation. And, you know, you can analyze it, uh, you know, whichever way is your favorite, that like essentially everything that you can throw at it kind of works. Uh, you know, you can apply matrix share of inequality, you can use trace method, whatever. Um, and you know you can all confirm. I won't do it. That you know, as long as m is like you know larger than some you know n square, you know you're going to get a non-trivial refutation. 
this all roughly makes sense? Okay, very good. So that was, you know, the L equals O of one regime. Now I want to tell you how to go beyond L equals O of one. Okay. So um, uh, how do we get? So the idea is, okay, so how do we get like the full trade-off that I promised you? So, you know, if I have n square over L constraints, I would like an n to the O of n time algorithm. That's what I would want. Okay. And so this result was first proven by Raghavendra Rao and Shram, this paper I talked about earlier in uh, 2016, 2017. And, you know, they use a slightly complicated matrix. And because, you know, uh, I wanted to give it a name, I just called it the symmetrized tensor power matrix. This is not like the standard edition name for it. It's just, you know, some description of how they arrive at this matrix. It doesn't matter what it is. It's, um, the reason I'm not writing it down is because, you know, we'll work with a different matrix. Uh, and this is rather complicated, okay? But if you want like some more pointer, this matrix is somehow, you know, corresponds to some high power of phi x. So you start with this polynomial phi x, it was a degree four polynomial, but now you work with like some high power of it and write down like a matrix for it instead. Okay, good. So, okay, they, they use this matrix and, you know, somehow it was like a fairly complicated analysis, uh, you know, it uses space power method, uh, you know, and you can see why some complications must come in here because it's going to be like highly dependent random matrix, right? Like the entries would have lots of dependencies. After all, you only have like n square bits or whatever of true randomness and the matrix is huge. So, you know, you're going to have like, um, um, you're going to have like lots of dependencies in the entries and, you know, analyzing dependent random matrix is kind of a challenge. So this was challenging. Good. So, um, um, uh, I guess even more of a problem for us is that not only was it like somewhat tedious, um, it also does not somehow, you know, delineate where is the randomness of the four tuples being used and where is the randomness of right-hand side being used. Just how, you know, things are. If you like played with trace method, it's not very transparent and, you know, where these two things are being used. And, you know, especially in a technical proof, it's hard to, you know, discern what's going on. So that's the reason, you know, somehow we don't know how to make this kind of an approach work for, you know, uh, um, the semi-random or the smooth set. Okay, so you know over time uh, there have been efforts to simplify you know this analysis, like try to find like simpler spectral refutations, um, and you know they're going to focus on this paper of Wine, Alawi, Moore that I mentioned before. So their main point was like this tensor PCA problem that I won't define, but they did actually have a simplification for even arity case, uh, you know, um, uh, of this uh, sub-exponential time refutation of RRS. Okay, so again the even versus odd problem actually strikes. You can you can actually get a nice matrix whose spectral refutations actually work and are like significantly simpler to analyze. This was really the cool point of the spam paper. I'm going to call it spam. You know, save some uh, seconds there, um, and it works. You know, for even IIT random XOR refutation. Okay, so this is even though it does not directly work for odd, this is like a cool idea. So I'm going to explain this idea to you. Okay, um, because it's a starting point. Okay, so. This, I can be actually much quicker here because it's so simple to describe, okay? So I'm going to write phi x as a quadratic form yet again, okay? But this time, I'm going to write it as a quadratic form of a huge matrix. It's going to be a matrix of n choose l by n choose l dimension for this parameter l, okay? So remember, l can be as large as n to the epsilon, right? Like it can be root n, for example. So it's going to be like a huge matrix, but I'll make sure that its quadratic form is still phi x, okay? What's the matrix? It's very simple. This time, in fact, the dimensions kind of give, give away, you know, what my rows and columns should mean. The rows and columns of this matrix would be indexed by sets of size L of the variables, okay? So now if I look at like an entry S comma T, I'm gonna write down the right-hand side of the equation or the monomial C if the symmetric difference of S and T equals C, okay? Good. Otherwise, I'll write down zero. Okay. Now, you know, uh, just to somehow make sure that uh, you know uh, this makes sense. Notice that this would be a rather sparse matrix because you know somehow, uh, even though my sets are of size L, I only have a non-zero entry if they like sim diff out to like a set of size four. So in particular, you know, they've got to share like L minus two variables, like L minus two variables in each the row and column that correspond to non-zero entries have to be exactly the same. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to have a non-zero entry. It's fine for us. We're going to work with it. Okay, good. So, um, so you know, so what I did here is like A sub C is the matrix corresponding to like a single constraint. And now, you know, to construct the matrix for the whole formula, I'm going to just add up the matrices corresponding to each C in the hypergraph H. Make sense? Okay, very good. So, um, you know, um, Vx 
is a quadratic form of this is also again easy to show. But this time I actually you know, suggest you don't try to verify this, okay? Yeah, instead, just observe that you know I could do this calculation in one, two, three steps, and I'm actually slower than most. So this means that you know it's a very, very simple proof. It's like just computation. Okay. Uh, the cool thing to observe is that this time I need like L-wise monomials of X as the vector to take the quadratic form. Okay, but everything else is exactly the same. I can see that you're not following my advice. I'm kidding. Um, good. So, so that's uh, you know. Um, uh, so you know, we've written like Px as a quadratic form of like a big matrix. Okay. Uh, you have a question? Not really. I'm just. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll wait. Next question. Oh, the intuition. Oh, I can maybe say one more line. Let's. See. Uh, if you look at like a monomial, like a L-wise monomial, it's like a product of you know bits. You know that comes from set S, and um, you know for T it's going to be like part of bits in set T. So if I like you know multiply them out, like everything squares out except like the symmetric difference. But probably like you are asking intuition for why it works, or the intuition for why it's true. Oh, that I'm going to show you. That I'll tell more. Good. So any other questions like about the definition of this matrix? Okay, very good. So, um, so the same trick applies. You know, once I've written as a quadratic form, you know, the L2 square now of this X circle L vector is like L2 L. So, you know, I'm just reduced to, you know, bounding the quadratic form, uh, bounding the spectral norm of this matrix A now. It's a huge matrix, but I still try to bound the spectral norm. And the question is, how do we bound this? Why, is, why should it be small? Okay. Good. So, uh, yeah, is this kind of like you took this uh, CSP, you, uh, you took C, you took the Lth power? And then you just looked at what, like you substituted the fact that xi square is equal to one, and you just looked at what remains. No. Oh, it's not that. Yeah, that's exactly what RRS did. So, so notice that you know. So let let me okay. So so let me go back, uh, and you know, uh, keep flashing this slide. Um, notice that the non-zero entries of this matrix really correspond to monomials of size four, not four L. Yeah. Okay. So so like no higher powers of phi x actually uh, appear in some sense here. I'm writing phi as a quadratic form, not phi to the L. Okay. Yeah, the, the Even though like the quadratic right. form is on the vector of L-wise monomials, I'm still constructing only phi from it. Okay. Does that answer your question, Vijay? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, you don't know the product of the B's. Yeah, know. yeah. That that's why like the matrix is very sparse. Like you know, the kind of matrix you're suggesting. Again, this comment does not need to be understood. Uh, but you know, if, if if for the matrix you're considering, Vijay, the matrix will be very very dense. This is the very sparse matrix in some sense. Okay, good. So that's great. That's uh, the matrix. And so the question is like, why is it spectral norm small? Right? Like, why should it be true? And how would we analyze it? Okay. So the key thing is, at least for random 4XR, the matrices A sub C's are independent random matrices. Like the randomness, the source of randomness is the right hand side's B's. And you know, they are independent. So, you know, I can still apply matrix turn off. Okay. And that, that's it. That, that's the proof. Like, you know, you just literally, like, you know, just compute what matrix turn off gives you. And, you know, the trade off will turn out to be M at least N square over L. Okay. Now, um, to answer Tony's question, wish I had a slide on it, but I don't. Um, so, so, um, how about I assume that you buy that it works out for now, and then at the end of the talk, I'll write something on the board, okay, to at least give you intuition why this might be true, why you should have expected this to be true, okay? I know this is suboptimal way to do it, but it will be a little bit uh, weird to hmm. make this go up and write, okay? So, okay, so for now, we'll all assume that, you know, it works out because I say it does, okay? Good, okay, very good. So, uh, but, but the key thing I want you to remember is that, you know, there was this curious construction of this symmetric difference matrix, okay? And that's somehow the key, like, you know, that, that's somehow the thing that made it all very simple, okay? Good. So, if you buy the previous thing, now I want to tell you how, you know, you can use it to prove five years conjecture, okay? That's what I want to do. That's, I want to relate like this calculation that you kind of sort of saw 
and you know um, uh, show how to prove you know this existence of even covers or like cycles in hypergraphs. Okay. Now, because I did the spectral calculation for you only for like random 4XR, this would be like the this won't be the proof of Pygas conjecture. It would really prove that random four uniform hypergraphs of appropriate density must have an appropriate length cycle. Okay. But at least at the end of this, you will see one how the spectral properties of the matrix are defined relate to the existence of cycles. And two, it would tell you that you know basically if I analyze an appropriate spectral algorithm for like the semi-random or smooth setting, maybe I'll get whatever I want, you know, in this worst case sense that Phi wants out. Okay. So that's what I would want you to take away from what I'm going to do. Okay. So uh, but you know, this this will make my life simple in terms of the calculations, etc. Okay. So I want to prove to you that if I have a four uniform hypergraph with like n square over L hyper edges, then it has a cycle of length about L log n. Okay. And this time I'm looking at random four uniform graphs. Okay. Okay. So the proof idea is kind of weird. And eventually, you know, there is a way to somehow present it in a more civilized fashion. But I will actually tell you the uncivilized way we came up with it. Okay. Because I think somehow, you know, it's, it's really illuminating. That's how we were thinking about it. And I think it's also somehow the simplest way to understand it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at like a four uniform, random four uniform hypergraph. But we are going to look at two different settings. One in which the right-hand sides are all equal to one. And two, one where the right-hand sides are all equal to independent plus minus ones. Okay. So the stuff we analyzed on the previous slide was the case when all the right-hand sides are independent plus minus ones, okay? But I'll also somehow keep in mind the setting of all ones. What's the difference? Well, if I have all ones on the right-hand side, the instance is fully satisfied, okay? So in particular, if I try to refute it, I should really fail spectacularly because, you know, the instance is like fully satisfied. Right? On the other hand, my previous argument has got to work on the plus minus one random bit because I kind of showed you how it does, okay? And in the end, the idea of the argument is that if there were no cycles, if there were no cycles of length L log N, then the previous argument does not care what the right-hand sides are. This is the idea. Like somehow if there were no cycles, I would be able to do the same thing and end up refuting the instance with like all ones on the right-hand side. Well, that's clearly bogus. So, you know, I have a contradiction, okay? If you want like a more civilized presentation of this idea instead of like this funky way, I can do it at the end, but I really like this way. Okay, I, I like some of the theatrics that go into this, so I'll do it. <laughs> okay, good. So what's the idea? Well, you know, remember, where did we use anything about the randomness of A? Let's go back to the previous argument. Let's recall what we did. We formed a matrix to represent PX as a quadratic form. That doesn't need any randomness. That's just a quadratic form representation. The only spot where randomness appears is when we bound the spectral norm of the matrix A. So what we'll do now is try to bound the spectral norm of the matrix A without using the randomness of the right-hand sides B and see what happens. Seems reasonable? Okay, very good. So um, what we are going to show is that, you know, I can bound the spectral norm if there were no cycles, even if the right-hand sides are, you know, arbitrary plus minus ones. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, and yeah, I guess uh, I'm uh, hammering in the point that, you know, this time A is a fixed deterministic matrix. There is really no randomness. Okay, I'm not going to use randomness of anything anymore. Good. So, um, have you seen like the trace method uh, to bound like the uh, spectral norm of matrices? Uh, if you haven't, like, let me say two lines that will potentially explain. Um, if I take a symmetric matrix A, okay, and its vector of eigenvalues is lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n. Okay. Uh, if I power the matrix, if I take like, say, you know, uh, some kth power of the matrix, then the eigenvalues of the kth power become I power of the uh, eigenvalues of A. So, you know, A to the K has eigenvalues lambda 1 to the K, lambda 2 to the K, and so on. Okay. Okay. You buy this. Now, if I take trace of the high power of this matrix, trace of like A to the K, then I'm going to get the sum of powers of the matrix, powers of the eigenvalues. Okay. And now the point is that, you know, if K is large enough, then somehow only the largest eigenvalue contributes the bulk because somehow, you know, the exponentiation really makes like the largest one stand out. So this is like the same idea that LP norms approximate L infinity norms, et cetera, for example. Okay. And if you remember why LP norms approximate L infinity norms, then, you know, you like the, 
the LP norm you need to work with happens to be log of the dimension of the vector. Okay, so the dimension of the eigenvalue vector is like you know n choose l. So the LP norm I should work with is like log of n choose l, which is about l log n. Okay, it's the same l log n that appears in the length of the cycle. Okay, good. So hopefully, like this makes some sense because I'm simply going to you know uh, assume that you buy that. If I take trace of some L log nth power of A, and then you know normalize it, so take like one over whatever two R, then you know I'm going to get like a good approximation to the uh, spectral norm of A. In fact, you know this is like a very very good approximation. Okay, this is almost a tight approximation in this case. Okay, seems reasonable. Okay, very good. So let's try to bound this. Okay, so last time we did it using matrix turn off, or at least hand waved it. This time, you know, we'll use uh, the trace method because there is no randomness, so I don't know how to, how to apply Chernoff, okay? So um, uh, I'm gonna use this simple connection that most of you might be familiar with, which is that if I take the trace of like two R power of A, then, you know, I basically get a sum over products of entries of A, where the entries correspond to closed walks on the vertices of the, you know, corresponding graph, okay? Seems uh, still reasonable. Okay, very good. So, you know, a closed walk of length 2R in, you know, uh, in, in, in this world corresponds to like a, you know, a 2R tuple of, you know, a row and column indices. So let's say these are like S1, S2, up to S tuple 2R, okay? So basically my closed walk is S1 to S2 to S3, so on up to S2R to S2R to S1, okay? Good, so trace of A to R is A to two R is simply the product of the entries of A summed over all possible closed walks of length two R. Okay, very good. So, um, oh yeah, I guess uh, because there is a closed walk, you know, you can talk about the underlying graph and the underlying graph is what I call the Kikuchi graph. Not important, but just like some naming thingy. Very good, so that's good. So now what? So let's look at, you know, which walks actually contribute a non-zero end. Okay, so remember, you know, if the right hand sides are all one, if the right hand sides B sub C that I had were all ones, then the entries of the matrix A are either zero or one. Right, like whenever the four tuple corresponds to a right hand, like four tuple corresponds to a constraint, it will be one and otherwise it will be zero, right? So any term like this can contribute either a one or a zero, right? So let's try to understand when it contributes a one, okay? It contributes a one if every pair, S1, S2, S2, S3, et cetera, corresponds to a constraint in my instance, right? Other, if, 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 if even one does not, then I get a zero, right? So in particular, A, S1, S2 equals, you know, the right-hand side of the constraint C, and it's a non-zero entry only when the symmetric difference of S1 and S2 equals some constraint C in the hypergraph, okay? Now, if I think of S1 and S2 as their corresponding indicator vectors, like over, you know, whatever n dimensional space, then, you know, this is simply the XOR of, the symmetric difference operation is simply the XOR of the indicator vectors, okay? So S1, S2 entry is non-zero, only if S1, XOR, S2 viewed as the indicator vectors, XOR is up to C, you know, also viewed as the indicator vector, okay? Very good. So, um, um, Let's look at now, you know, uh, two possible uh, cases that we are analyzing. When B sub C's are independent plus minus ones, this is the setting that we analyzed at first. That time, you know, we were using matrix turnoff. But now we can ask, what happens if I take the expectation of trace of A to the two R and the B sub C's were random plus minus ones, okay? Now, the key point is, if, you know, uh, if all the edges, for example, if all the uh, pairs, S1, S2, S2, S3, et cetera, correspond to different constraints, okay, then because my bits plus minus ones are independent for every C, the expectation must be Z, okay? So in other words, the expectation of a single term here, in the case when B sub Cs are plus minus one random, is non-zero only when, every C somehow appears even number of times because then it like cancels out, right? Like then it squares out, right? So contributing walk must somehow use the same C even number of times, in particular, at least twice. Still make sense? 
Okay, so I'm going to call this contributing box returning box or even returning box. Okay, these are basically you know uh, using the same edge or using the same C any one number of times. Okay, so um, here's the key idea. The key idea is that if there were no small cycles in the hypergraph, and I write down the same expression. Now, no matter what the BCs are, I don't even take expectations anymore because I don't care about the B sub Cs, exactly the same walks will contribute. Everything else will be zero by virtue of there being no cycle. Okay? So just to summarize, what has happened is, in the B sub C equals plus minus one random case, we look at which walks contribute. They've got to be even returning. And now we'll show that you know, if there are no cycles, then somehow a different argument somehow shows that the same set of walks contribute, even though there is no randomness in B sub C's. Okay? Because the same walks contribute, and each walk contributes a one or a zero, the estimate that we get in the two cases has got to be the same. But we already computed the estimate in the random case. It succeeded in refuting. Therefore, we must succeed in refuting if this whole you know, <laughs> uh, discussion somehow was correct. The only thing that I assumed in this discussion was that there was no L log and then cycle. That's got to be wrong because you know, this is clearly a bogus conclusion. This is the idea. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll justify this observation to you. Yes. Just to understand. So if what you could say is the following thing, you could just apply random signs to every row and column of A. And what you get is a matrix whose entries are k-wise independent if you don't have any k cycles. Yes. Right? And if they're not completely independent, but they're k-wise independent, and then this just says like the trace to any power less than k is just going to be the same. So, so that's a good intuition, but that's not entirely what is happening. The reason is that, so let's look at you know, the, the suggestion you just made. Uh -huh. For the suggestion to pan out, I need a lot of randomness. I need like randomness, which is like every row. You said that every row and every column needs to have a random bit in some sense. Yeah, but that doesn't change the operator, no. So right, right. No. So the point I'm making is that you know I I only have like n square or like n square over l bits of randomness. Sure, you can also do that. You can also just to any yeah to any pair. Yeah. Okay. Good. Right. Like uh, so. Or, or just but to, I think it would give you the same thing if you. Yes. Yes. The estimate is the same. Like in yeah. the end, the estimate is the same. The 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 somehow like maybe the the cometally interesting part is that the structure of the Kikuchi matrix, which governs which walks contribute in the baseline case, like you know, basically many of them are zeros, right? Yeah. yeah sure. So somehow that's combining with uh, you know this uh, small amount of randomness to give the same estimate. So somehow both are important, is what I'm saying. Uh, you can't hope to apply this argument to an arbitrary matrix. Sure. Okay. 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 Very good. So let me justify this, uh, you know, uh, observation. It's uh, it's it's also not very hard at all. Okay. So uh, let's just justify this observation that you know if H has no cycle of length log of n choose L, so L log n, then in fact you know all contributing terms, all two R tuples, the closed walks that contribute, must in fact be even return. And this time I've got to prove this without using any randomness of uh, you know B sub C's on the right hand side. Okay. So we already like you know saw this, but if a term contributes, if a walk contributes, then it's got to be true that the XOR of the corresponding indicator vectors is like uh, you know uh, the first two things has to correspond to one uh, you know C, and then the next two things have to correspond to the next C, and so on. Right. If if like you know if any of these CIs are not like constraints in your hypergraph, then you're gonna get a zero. So these equations must be satisfied, right? And so now you know, notice that each SI occurs twice in this list of equations, right? Like S2 occurs twice and then S3 occurs twice and so on. So if I add the right hand side, I'm gonna get a zero modulo two. Therefore, you know, I must have that the right hand sides, the CIs, the indicator vectors also add up to zero modulo two, right? But what does that mean? Well, you know, if the sum of the indicator vectors of CI is zero modulo two, um, and CIs were all distant, okay, then this can happen only if uh, you know every uh, uh, every vertex occurs in you know an even number of CIs. That's the only way you know their indicator vectors could add up to zero if CIs were distant, okay. 
So that must mean that the only way this could be true is if you know each CI occurs, each CI itself occurs even about time, because I've already assumed that there is no small cycle. Okay, this is it. This this is the proof. So let me like pause for like thirty seconds to make sure that uh, you know you bought at least the bulk of it. Good. What happens if you have just some of them appearing, even number? Good. Yeah. So like you know, yeah. Good question. Yeah. So let let's uh, uh, let's maybe discuss that. So what happens if like some of them are repeating, but some others are not? It's like you know, extract all the repeating business. Like extract all the CIs that are even number of times and remove them. The rest of the sum should still add up to zero. All right, it's a it's a shorter cycle. If yeah. You're assuming that the, uh, right. Okay. For some reason. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Any other questions? This is it. Like you know, we we are done. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's uh, the done symbol. Good. So uh, I'm going to move on because this is all I'm going to tell you about the proof strategy. Uh, but you know, maybe I can summarize like what's going on is that you know somehow you want to analyze what happens to the spectrum of an appropriate matrix with random B sub C's, and if you can somehow prove that the spectrum is upper bounded, then you know you can also transfer that idea to get like the existence of like small cycles in hypergraphs. That's somehow the idea. So we did it in random four in four hypergraphs. If you now do it for like more complicated randomness structures, okay, there is some technical work required there, but you know the rest of the proof would be just of the same sort. Okay, very good. So, um, uh, how much time do I have, Tony? Or am I like already like minus five? No, you're fine. Okay. Oh, very good. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, you know, I'm not going to do more math, uh, but I guess you know, uh, no serious math anyway. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about you know what happens to the semi-random setting and the odd IT setting, and just like give you a rough picture of what actually goes on there. Okay. Um, so uh, now you know. Imagine that you want to work with semi-random instances, meaning like you know you want to flip everything with probability you know half, but the class structure is completely arbitrary. Worst case, okay. Um, let's say you know you're still working with four XOR, okay, just to understand what's going to go on here, okay. So now the issue is that if you write down the same matrix, the spectral norm is actually truly not small. Like you know, it's it's not a question of your proof; it's just like false that the spectral norm is small. It's also very easy to see that like you can somehow you know. Uh, choose an instance that somehow stacks lot of edges in a way that you know a row becomes very heavy, for example. And you know somehow if you have a row which has like many many constraints, the spectral norm will blow up, and that won't be very nice for you. Okay. Um, and so the idea you know to handle this is to instead work with like you know some kind of a decomposition of the matrix. Okay. So what we'll do is like you know somehow uh, observe. That we only care. So even though the spectral norm is large here, it somehow is not relevant for us. Why? Because remember the quadratic form that we took in the refutation argument was over a vector whose entries were plus minus one. In particular, they were all equal. So we were taking quadratic forms over completely spread out vectors. No small subset of coordinates somehow you know captured most of the L2 mass of the vector. So really, like, care about quadratic forms on like completely spread out or flat or dense spectrums. And so the key idea observation here is that you know even though the spectral norm is large, you can somehow always blame it on like sparse vectors. Yes, but you you described one obstacle. Another obstacle is if I take like a random parity which is completely uni uniform, but the right hand side are all ones, the matrix is going to have a very large correlation with the all ones vector. Yes. Right. Yes. This is very spread. Yes. But it's going to have a very bad spectral. Yes, norm. but I'm also okay with that because in that case the instance is completely satisfiable. So I I, I don't even care about yeah, yeah, but 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 then do a semi-random you know noise every entry with probability zero point one. You still have a very large correlation yes. with the old ones vector. Yes. Yes. So somehow you have to kill the large eigenvectors. So that, that's why I'm working with the semi-random setting already. So like in some sense you know what you're saying is not a problem for me because I have a different deduction from smooth to semi-random. I didn't follow. Sorry. Okay. So let me let me repeat. You're right. In the smooth setting, I'm only randomly perturbing each entry. 
Yes. If I were to apply this spectral norm approach directly, I would be in trouble because as you said- Ah, is half-half. Okay, okay, okay. I see. But you didn't tell us why. I didn't tell you why that's true. Okay. Yeah, so it's like a simple step, but somehow it's really important because you can't hope to apply okay. spectral refutation. So, so you don't like analyze this and I mean, you do it by, by completely different argument. Yes. To say you can take some random, yes. then I agree it's not a problem. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And somehow, okay, so you know, I'm, I'm sweeping a lot of things like that under the rug. You to make sure that all the kind of arguments that I'm doing there don't hurt my eventual argument for Pygus conjecture. Like, you know, I, all the operations I do for like smooth to semi random, et cetera, also have to be done in some sense in this setting when the B sub Cs are not random, et cetera, for my previous argument to go through. But let's not worry about it. It, it kind of works out. Okay. Let's say we only care about semi random because, you know, I can show you at least one non trivial or one interesting piece of the argument. And then, as you said, in this case, at least, um, if we kill away the obstacle of sparse vectors generating large quadratic forms, like you know, some small number of rows being very heavy is like equivalent to a sparse vector generating a large quadratic form, then in some sense, you know, I'm done. But in this case, I'm already happy because I don't care about sparse quadratic forms. Like somehow my um my the kind of vectors I'm interested in are really like you know fully dense vectors. Now, one little thing you might be worried about is okay, this is all fine, but how am I going to be able to check that? Um, the quadratic forms on dense vectors are small, right? Like no longer is it a spectral norm. So I need some efficiently computable quantity. But it turns out that here there's a simple SDP relaxation that will do it for me. Okay. So that, that's it. Okay. That, that's sort of idea that you know you, you realize that you know you only have to care about dense quadratic forms. And you know, somehow spectral norm won't work, but like an appropriate SDP relaxation will. Okay. Good. So yeah, the, the other stuff on the side is about how we analyze the SCP relaxation, but you know, I don't want to go into the details of it at the moment. Um, let's look at like you know this issue of uh, what happens to the odd IT instances because that's like I don't know seventy percent of the paper. Um, uh, somehow you know all that I said you know somehow doesn't make sense for four XOR because I'm actually at a loss to even start. Right, like I don't know the right matrix to write. Now you might think that maybe I can write a rectangular matrix. You can do that, but then that will not give you the right trade-off. It will give you a trade-off which is off by like you know some root n factor. The issue is that somehow if you write a rectangular matrix, that kind of corresponds to treating a three XOR instance as a four XOR instance. And so you know clearly you'll go, you're going to get like the wrong trade-off. Okay. And so uh, somehow you know uh, this BAM paper, which was like somehow the first one to come up with this Kikuchi matrix idea, they proposed a version of the Kikuchi matrix, and you know they I think kind of softly conjectured that maybe that will actually work out, but it turns out it doesn't. It turns out that you know uh, somehow I actually don't know any Kikuchi matrix that even for the case of random three XOR, like fully random case, uh, you know the spectral norm somehow gives a refutation. I actually don't know any such matrix, and uh, somehow you know the issue is that um, uh, in in because of the structure of the matrices here, there are always heavy rows in this odd case. You know, in some sense, any natural way of defining the matrix turns out to have heavy rows. So what we do instead is like you know we show that. Somehow you can globally remove some rows of the matrix and still make things happen. Okay. Now um, this row pruning or removing rows is easy to do, or like relatively easy to do once you have the idea for random instances. But for completely arbitrary instances, it's a little bit of a problem because you know now it's like you know I have to deal with like arbitrary you know uh, uh, hydrograph structures. And so, so what we do actually is we identify like some combinatorial condition under which you know this strategy will succeed. And it turns out that it's like very nicely related to this issue of uh, no large sunflowers. So somehow we want the hypergraph to have no large sunflowers. You know, okay, if you don't have sunflowers, basically all it means is that you know there should be no small subset of variables that somehow are subsets of many different hyperedges. Okay, and I'm not giving the giving the quantitative version of this, but somehow you know we we want like all subsets to appear in like roughly equal number of uh, you know hyperedges. So this property is called small spread. If you like follow this, you know, uh, uh, some new developments in this direction on like proving the improved bounds of sunflower lemma, et cetera, this kind of, you know, condition also appears there. Somehow the results though are not directly relevant for us. So what we instead do is like we prove a new uh, uh, regularity decomposition lemma for like hypergraphs. So what, what we do is like we show how to take any hyper hypergraph and decompose it into, um, you know, pieces the, the resulting hypergraphs will not be of the same arity. Some of them will be of smaller arity, up to some error term. And you know, each of the non-error terms would have this property that you know no large sunflower exists. And it turns out that if you have no large sunflower property, then you can prune away some rows globally. 
And then, you know, in the random case, vector norm works. In the non-random case, you can do the kind of trick we were doing earlier. Like, you know, you can show that you can blame the large spectral norm only on sparse vectors. So, you know, you can deal with SDPs and whatnot. So at the end, like in some sense, you combine these two or three ingredients and, you know, it kind of works out. I'm sorry, like I'm a bit sketchy here, but, you know, um, that's uh, roughly, you know, what's going on. Good. So it's all over. Here's the summary for you. Uh, the high level, you know, uh, uh, summary of the result itself is that, you know, somehow smooth is no harder than random. Like somehow, you know, if at all you suspected that smooth could be somehow closer to worst case, that's not true. It kind of behaves like random for all the kind of results we know. Okay. Um, but the main takeaway that, you know, might be relevant for something that you are doing, let's say, for example, for hypergraphs or whatever, is that so somehow there is a reduction to a graph problem. This I find very exciting. Like, you know, I, I've dealt with hypergraphs for a lot of, uh, uh, in a lot of, uh, my research and um, somehow they are kind of hard to deal with and like somehow you know it's very exciting to me that you can reduce a certain problem in hypergraph in a non-lossy way to a certain graph problem and that looks uh, you know interesting and two somehow you know that uh, uh, the idea of all this algorithmic development was to find like somehow the right way to refute right simplest way to refute the random instance and then somehow you know move it over so you know uh, seems like a good philosophy uh, in general Good. So um, uh, let me, you know, uh, uh, just like spend a couple of minutes to tell you open directions because I think there are several, and you know, all of them are actually very exciting, and you know, some of you might actually like this. So um, uh, one thing I want to uh, uh, ask: so you know, I told you the five injective is true, but there is this lock to the two k of n that we use, and I kind of feel like this is too basic a result for us to like be okay with log factor losses. Okay, now I don't always advocate for removing all the logs. But you know, this is very basic. It's a very, it's, it's a very basic GERT density trade-off for hypergraphs. This has got to be the right, and we should be able to get the right answer here. Uh, and you know, so we, we, like, we have some partial progress, you know, so with students Siddhant Mohanty and uh, Tim CA. Uh, Siddhant, by the way, is at Berkeley and Tim is my student at CMU. Uh, uh, we've been thinking about like some non-backtracking versions of, you know, uh, the kind of matrices that I was working with. And it turns out that the spectral double counting argument I showed recovers the sharp mode bound that AHL proved uh, if you basically apply the same technique on the non-backtracking mock matrix. Okay, so, so that's like some partial progress that we have that we can at least reprove the, uh, you know, irregular uh, mode bound. Uh, we don't know how to go beyond it at the moment. We don't know how to do hypergraphs, but that's my hope for, you know, how to remove all the logs and get the right result. Okay, two. Um, okay, this is speculative. Uh, which is like to find a refutation algorithm, a polynomial time refutation algorithm for random 3 set instances with little o of n to the 1.5 constraints. So basically I'm asking you to beat the so-called spectral threshold in polynomial time, okay? Now, there are some conventional wisdom kind of results to show that maybe this is not possible, but all we really truly have, mathematically speaking, are lower bounds against very specific class of algorithms and, you know, for example, the kind of refutations I was showing you, these kind of linear algebraic uh, linear dependency based refutations, they're not captured by these techniques anymore. Okay. So um, uh, I think it's, it's very plausible that there is a polynomial time algorithm to refute below n to the 1.5 density. Um, and, you know, there's a natural route, which is to somehow find the kind of certificate I showed you today in polynomial time. Now, this is not a new direction, right? Like, I think since the existence of Phi Gay effect result, I think people have thought about this. But I feel like there is probably a new insight because now there is like a nice translation of this hypergraph cycles into a certain graph cycle problem. I kind of implicitly showed you today. And so my hope is that you know, there is some uh, technology for this kind of a graph problem that we could hope to use and you know, uh, get an algorithm. Long shot, but I think it's still worth a try. Uh, finally, something that I have no idea about, which is to find certificates of refutation existence, to existence results for like polynomial size certificates below the end to the 1.4 FKO threshold. And here, like, I, it will be very surprising if into the 1.4 is somehow the right number for whatever reason. I don't see anything kosher about it. So, you know, I think it should, we should be able to beat, I, I would suspect we should be able to beat it, but I've got no idea how. Good. That's uh, basically all. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry for like going four minutes over. Thank you. So a couple of questions now. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. So so firstly, revisiting the question I had earlier, I want to amend the, the, the statement. So can you do summation xi squared, take it to the nth power, multiply it by phi of x, 
does that recover the Kikuchi quadratic form more or less? Uh, the polynomial you'll have will still be like two uh, L degree, no? Yeah, sure. But but I guess the or, or maybe I'm misunderstanding the construction you're proposing. But I guess the point is that the quadratic form I'm proposing will will basically have the quadratic form would be a polynomial of degree four, even though the matrix is of size n choose n. It's it's a polynomial of degree two L, right? Because you're writing it as a quadratic form of X tensor L. No. Um, okay, it's a good question. The quadratic form has L wise monomials of X appearing. Yeah, yeah. But because of the structure of the matrix, every monomial which is of a degree bigger than four has zero coefficient. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So even in what I'm suggesting, you're then going to substitute xi square equals one. Okay. And then you'll you'll get something a much lower degree. Not really, because uh, you know most of the degree two L monomials will not cancel in what you proposed, if I understood it correctly. So, so I, I'll tell you like a different interpretation of this in case like you know uh, it helps. So, uh, one way to view this matrix is to think of it as like some kind of. Uh, uh, so, imagine uh, you know thinking of the hyper edges in the hypergraph as like you know. Uh, uh, indicators of vectors in the hypercube of n dimensions. And so then you can take like the Cayley graph on the hypercube with those as the generators. Okay. And so the graph I have is basically, you know, the restriction of that Cayley graph to uh, vertices that are of like, you know, uh, sets of size L. Does that somehow, I mean, there is some kind of a nice group structure. And so that's the reason I wanted to say this. Um, somehow, you know, this, this uh, nice algebraic structure, the fact that it comes from like this uh, Cayley graph like thing is kind of important, I think, in this. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I need to take this offline and think about it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the second question is, uh, uh, like, can this be generalized to sort of uh, pairwise independent CSPs or distance to pairwise independence? That kind of Good. Thing? Uh, yes. So, you know, I, I, I stuck to KSAT, but, you know, all of this technology actually works, you know, in the right way for all CSPs. And the reason is very simple. You know, it's not like we to do anything new. It's because, you know, that technology already reduces to doing things for XOR. And so w thing just... Uh... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. Uh, thanks. I'll ask my questions offline. Okay. Yeah, thanks.